for example, xenobots, right? We make xenobots, this is, or anthrobots. These are um, biological systems that have never existed on earth before. We have no idea what their cognitive properties are. We're learning, we found some things, but you can't predict that from first principles because they're not at all what their past history would, uh, would, would inform you of. Can you actually explain briefly what a xenobot is and what an anthrobot is? So one of the things that we've been doing is trying to create novel beings that have never been here before. The reason is that typically when you have a biological system, an animal or a plant, and you say, hey, why does it have certain forms of behavior, certain forms of anatomy, certain forms of physiology? Why, why does it have those? The answer is very is, is always the same. Well, there's a history of uh, evolutionary selection, and there's a long, uh, long um, history going going back of adaptation, and there are certain environments, and this is what survived, and so that's why it has. So uh, what I what I wanted to do was was break out of that mold and to 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 basically force us as a community to to dig deeper into where these things come from and that means taking away the crutch where you just say well it's ev it's evolutionary selection that's that that's why it looks like that so in order to do that we have to make artificial um, synthetic beings now to be clear we are starting with living cells so it's not that they had no evolutionary history the cells do they had evolutionary history in frogs or humans or whatever but the creatures they make and the capabilities that these creatures have were never directly selected for and in fact they never existed so you can't tell the same kind of story and what i mean is we can take epithelial cells off of an early frog embryo and we don't change the dna no synthetic biology circuits no material scaffolds no nanomaterials no weird drugs none of that what we're mostly doing is liberating them from the instructive influences of the rest of the cells that they were in in their bodies. And so when you do that, right, no, normally these cells uh, are bullied by their neighboring cells into having a very boring life. They become a two-dimensional outer covering for the, for the embryo and they keep out the bacteria and that's that. So you might ask, well, what are these cells capable of when you take them away from that influence? So when you do that, they form another little, um, life form we call a xenobot and it's this uh self motile little thing that has uh, cilia covering its surface the cilia are coordinated so they row against the water and then the thing starts to move and has all kinds of amazing properties it has different gene expression so it has its own novel transcriptome it's able to do things like kinematic self-replication meaning make copies of itself from loose cells that you put in its environment it has the ability to respond to sound which normal embryos don't do it has these novel capacities and we did that and we said, look, here are some amazing features of this novel system. Let's try to understand where they came from. And some people said, well, maybe it's a frog specific thing. You know, uh, maybe, maybe this is just something unique to frog cells. And so he said, okay, what's the furthest you can get from, from frog embryonic cells? How about human adult cells? And so we took, uh, cells from adult human patients who were donating tracheal epithelia for, um, biopsies and things like that. And those cells in, again, no genetic change, nothing like that. They self-organized into something we call anthrobots, again, self-motile little creature, 9,000 different gene expressions. So about half the genome is now different. And uh, they have interesting abilities. Uh, for example, they can heal human neural wounds. So in vitro, if you if you pl uh, plate some um, some neurons and you put a big scratch through it, so you damage them, anthrobots can sit down and they will they will try they will spontaneously without have us having to teach them to do it, they will spontaneously try to uh, knit the neurons across. Uh, what is this video that we're looking at here? So this is an anthrobot. So often when I give talks about this, I show people this video and I say, "What do you think this is?" And people will say, well, it looks like some primitive organism you got from the bottom of a pond somewhere. And I'll say, well, what do you think the genome would look like? And is it, well, the genome would look like some primitive creature, right? If you sequence that thing, you'll get 100% Homo sapiens. And that doesn't look like any stage of normal human development. It doesn't act like, uh, like any stage of, of human development. It has the ability to move around. It has, as I said, over 9,000 differential gene expressions. Uh, also, interestingly, it is uh, younger um, than the cells that it comes from. So it actually has the ability to roll back its age. And we, we, could, we could talk about that and, and what the implications of that are. But, uh, but uh, to go back to your original question, what we're doing with these kinds of systems. Try and talk to it. We're trying to talk to it. That's exactly right. And not just to this, we're trying to talk to molecular networks. So gene, so we found a couple of years ago, we found that gene regulatory networks, never mind the cells, but the molecular pathways inside of cells cells can have uh, several different kinds of learning, including Pavlovian conditioning. And what we're doing now is trying to talk to it. The biomedical applications are obvious. Instead of, hey, Siri, you want, uh, hey, liver, 
why do I feel like crap today? And you want an answer. Well, you know, your potassium levels are this and that, and I don't feel, uh, you know, I don't feel good for these reasons. And you should be able to talk to these things and there should be able to be an interface that allows us to communicate, right? And and I think AI is going to be a huge uh, component of that interface of allowing us to talk to these systems. It's a, it's a tool to combat our mind blindness, to help us see diverse other very unconventional minds that are all around us. Can you generalize that? Let's say we meet an alien or an unconventional mind uh, here on Earth. Think of it as a black box. You show up. What's the uh, procedure for trying to get some hooks into a uh, communication protocol with the thing? Yeah, that is exactly the mission of, of my lab. It is, it is to enable us to develop tools to recognize these things, to learn to uh, communicate with them, to ethically relate to them, and mm -hmm. in general, to expand our ability to, uh, to do this in the, in, the, in, the, in the world around us. I specifically chose these kinds of things because... They're not as alien as proper aliens would be. So we have some hope. I mean, we're made of them. We have so many things in common. There's some hope of understanding them. You're talking about xenobots and anthropods. Xenobots and anthropods. anthropods and cells and everything else. But they're alien in a couple of important ways. One is the space they live in is very hard for us to imagine. What space do they live in? Well, um, your body, your body cells, long before we had a brain that was good for navigating three-dimensional space, was navigating the space of anatomical possibilities. It was going from, you start as an egg and you have to become, you know, a, a snake or a, or a, or a, you know, a giraffe or whatever, or a human, whatever, whatever we're going to be. And I specifically am telling you that this, this, this general idea, when people model that with uh, kind of cellular automata type of ideas, this open loop kind of thing where, well, everything just follows local rules and eventually there's complexity and, and, and here you go. Now, now you've got a, now you've got a giraffe or a human. Um, I, I'm specifically telling you that that model is totally insufficient to grasp what's actually going on. What's actually going on. And there've been many, many experiments on this is that the system is navigating a space. It is navigating a space of anatomical possibilities. If you try to block where it's going, it will try to get around you. If you try to challenge it with things it's never seen before, it will try to come up with a with a solution if you if you really uh, defeat its ability to do that which you can you know they're not infinitely intelligent so you can you can defeat them you will either get birth defects or you will get creative problem solving such as what you're seeing here with xenobots and anthropods if you can't be a human you'll be some you can you'll find another way to be in you can be an anthropod for example or you'll be something else